YouTube used to mostly consist of organic, real creators, normal people like you and me, whom had a creative drive or a unique personality and a desire to share their content and creativity with the world. YouTube is called YouTube because the platform was supposed to be about you, the individual creator. You can upload your own videos. You can build your own audience. You can gain fame or develop infamy for your work. This platform was created for you, for us. Everything that used to make YouTube a social media platform has been stripped from the website over the years. And it's no longer as easy for creators to maintain or develop relationships with each other. There used to be a sense of community on this site, but that has been replaced. YouTube is bare bones now in comparison. It's not really social media anymore. It's a collection of isolated creators. Today, YouTube is almost completely ruled by industry plants, engineered celebrities, and people that have capitulated to the desires of YouTube, Google, and the entertainment industry. Channels and creators that are managed by large corporations and other outside interests. Sure, channels like that have existed for a long time, like D News, MTV, they've all been on YouTube for a while now. Those are obvious because they advertise their affiliations. They don't hide that they're managed by large corporations. But now there are more subtle industry plants, or fake YouTubers even, and managed channels on this site that don't make their connections obvious. Artificial celebrities that pretend to be normal YouTubers who manage their own channels, but in reality get their video ideas and scripts from outside sources. I would love to do a video where I just blast and expose a ton of these fake artificial entertainers, people that are being managed and handled by an outside source, but most of my knowledge on this subject comes from personal experience, and if I tried to tell you who those people were, you'd probably just say that I'm crazy or get frustrated that I have no proof. So instead of exposing an actual shill, I'm going to describe how they affect the site and give you an example of what a shill might look like. It's interesting how this platform has evolved over the decades. Whereas in the past, someone like a Justin Bieber or a Donald Glover would get their start online, then move on to something bigger after proving themselves. Now, lots of modern major celebrities have their own YouTube channels to complement their existing work. People that are getting famous elsewhere, like in Hollywood, and then coming back here to YouTube to use this platform to share their own work or as a vlog to stay connected with their audience and appear more down to earth. Along with the introduction of mainstream media outlets, as well as all of these new celebrities, Google has gone a long way to try to cater YouTube to appear more mainstream to reflect that, deleting or hiding channels that are more toxic or go against the grain. So one of the organic results of that is you're going to get a lot of normal, real YouTubers trying their best to keep up with what is considered acceptable and normal on the site. And in an environment like that, almost everyone's going to come off as a little bit of a shill. But it's kind of wild to think about how YouTube works today. An idiot nobody, like myself, now shares a platform with pop singers and major Hollywood actors. I upload my work to the same source as Jack Black and Brie Larson. We might even upload something on the same day, and we might even share a portion of our audience with each other. But the normal idiots like me? We built up YouTube to try to prove ourselves against the mainstream entertainment industry. And now now the mainstreamers have come back here to prove themselves on our platform. It's crazy that I have the potential to connect with or reach similar people, a similar audience. And in a way, I'm rubbing shoulders with them and I'm on equal ground with these mainstream entertainers. This might actually be a unique time in entertainment 
history for that reason. A brief time in history when mainstream entertainers were sharing a platform with actual neckbeards. It became frustrating to a lot of creators when celebrities initially invaded YouTube, and I agree that it wasn't great news when people like Will Smith became YouTubers. It's terrible competition for those of us who depend on this platform to make our living, and it diminishes the uniqueness and the reach of YouTubers when we're overshadowed by big Hollywood names. Google is a thousand times more likely to support and recommend an established celebrity over a regular YouTuber, but I don't really think that this is as offensive an idea as most people seem to feel. If anything, those creators kind of legitimize those of us who gave YouTube its name and made it what it is today. It's almost as if people like Will Smith are endorsing us by endorsing this site. But because of this, YouTube is not what it used to be. Google does not reward creators the way that it used to, and it doesn't allow people to gain success in the same organic way. Before, if you had lots of views, people would subscribe, and more subscribers translated into more views. People voted for the success of a creator by engaging with their channel, engaging with their content. But now, the algorithms ignore the classic symbols of success in favor for engineering a specific image for the desired YouTube brand. Getting consistently high views on videos no longer translates into gaining large subscriber counts. And similarly, having a lot of subscribers doesn't automatically translate into getting a lot of views. YouTube is not for you anymore. YouTube is not about you. YouTube is about making money and promoting specific types of creators and creating a perception about what is acceptable and what should be seen as successful on YouTube. God, in my case, they've been actively removing followers from my channels for years now. Pretty much consistently deleting 2,000 followers per month in an attempt to kill my channel. So I can tell you from my own firsthand experience, YouTube isn't just burying some channels, it's actively trying to remove them and disincentivize them from continuing to do their work. Sometimes I would gain back a few subscribers if I made a successful video, only to have Google delete 2,000 more people the next month like clockwork. And by aping my channel this way, they're essentially telling the algorithm not to recommend my work anymore. Normally a YouTuber would get a 50-50 split between subscribers and new viewers on a video. Now only about 10 to 20 percent of my views come from non-subscribers. My YouTube analytics are basically admitting to me that they don't recommend my videos. So if you want to accuse me of being biased in this video and my motivation for making this is that I'm angry, that's fine. I'm not going to waste any energy denying that. I have to admit here that I have fallen on hard times. It's becoming increasingly more and more difficult every month to come up with enough money for my rent and my groceries. So please consider supporting my Patreon, becoming a channel member, using the super thanks button in the comments section, throwing me a contribution to my PayPal, or even buying a t-shirt or a sticker from my merch store. The links for all of that are in the description. Any little bit helps. I thank you so much for your support. But for a time, I was successful here. I lived a modestly comfortable life for about five years because of my viewership, so I usually never felt any pressure to make videos consistently. My main focus was just on being funny and being entertaining. And because YouTube incentivized me to make content that would make my audience happy, that was always a consideration of mine. Part of the reason my content is so different now is because I'm not thinking about making my audience happy. I'm making what makes me happy. I'm trying to expose all the that I don't like in the world, and because I see myself as failing, I'm trying to go down swinging. And because my motivations have changed so much, I recently started to notice that a lot of creators whom are the most successful on YouTube end up doing more work after they've achieved success. Instead of settling into a specific production schedule and getting comfortable, they stretch themselves out thinner and thinner. Creators whom are making more and more money and gaining more 
more and more fame, don't slow down to rest to enjoy their easy life. Instead, they build more channels, they create more platforms, they spend more time performing for live stream audiences themselves out for more likes, for more views, for more individual donations and super chats. Why? Is it greed? For the longest time, I assumed this was an ego thing. People who are addicted to money want more money. People who are addicted to fame want more fame. That made sense to me at first, but I've come to the realization that some of the largest and most popular creators on the platform are not choosing Choosing how to spend their time here. They're being told what to create and how much to create. They're given orders or strong suggestions and are being directed by outside influences to perform a specific way for their audiences. Some of these guys are even reading scripts that have been written for them. They're not even choosing what to say on their own channel. YouTube is filled with manufactured artificial celebrities that aren't creating what they want. They've become a mouthpiece for some sort of corporate interest or the mainstream agenda. A lot of these characters even seem to start off organically. They appear to be normal people creating what they love at first, but then one day they begin to act like a bizarre industry shill. They would cut their teeth on being a contrarian, but then one day start defending mainstream narratives. Creators whom seem to throw away their unique personality traits, stubborn opinions, and established principles, and start peddling popular ideas on their channel like they're an employee of a large network. Creators that have been compromised, hijacked by the entertainment industry or some sort of corporate interest, or perhaps they've sold out in order to gain legitimacy in the entertainment industry. And I think that there have been creators like that on on this platform for years. I believe that if a Donald Glover type were to suddenly become famous on YouTube today, instead of getting whisked off to Hollywood to become a star on a television show, now someone from the entertainment industry would come to him and start demanding that he conduct himself a specific way on his channel. But there are different levels of selling out and there are lots of different kinds of incentives for a creator to want to capitulate to the entertainment industry, or to behave like a shill for the mainstream. A few years ago, Hollywood started this new trend of inviting specific blog writers, podcasters, and online personalities to certain events and even pre-screenings for films, and in return, these writers, podcasters, and creators were expected to write favorable, positive reviews for these films, even hype them up and promote them to their respective audiences. Red Letter Media has spent a lot of time talking about this sort of agreement between online personalities and the entertainment industry, and even created a satire series called The Nerd Crew, where they demonstrate what this kind of relationship would look like from the creator's side. Oh, I just want to note, these swag bags are not cheap. That's true, that's true. Yeah, they are filled with toys and promotional materials that sometimes can be valued at, you know, up to $20. Right, right. Actually, the, the Sony executive who, who gave me the replacement swag bag, he actually shoved me up against the table and put his hand over my mouth and he said, you better give this movie a good review. My career is riding on this, you fat, pudgy f this is one of those open secrets that everyone knows about. Some online personalities don't even show shame over this practice, and they've treated their favorable promotion of specific IPs as a grind, as a job that they perform specifically in order to get treated like special VIPs at these industry events. I think the most infamous example is Christian Harloff from The Schmo Knows. He had a meltdown on the Collider podcast because he wasn't invited to Galaxy's Edge. I'm, I'm not going to argue with anyone in this room that it comes from a place yeah. of being butthurt. Okay. So, when you, so you're like look, a sad nerd right so now. So when the comments come in and go, oh, get over it. Maybe I should. Guess not. But guess what? I'm not. I've been busting my f***ing ass being a Star Wars fan for five years. I feel the, the same show. way about DC right. when things happen. And, and, I get it. And so my thing, my thing is too. I, I, I've been called shill. I get, I get screamed at. You know. So let this one. Let, let me be a shill for this one. Let me go in and experience this 
People like this do not create commentary about media to their audience because they have a strong opinion or a unique perspective. They literally see supporting corporations like Disney as a job for which they deserve to be rewarded with special treatment. This is a f shill. He's saying the quiet part out loud. He may be the only idiot dumb enough to admit it, but there are hundreds of these guys. After they purchased Star Wars and Marvel, Disney appeared to covertly influence a lot of creators to hype up their IPs in this way. During that time, it started to become extremely obvious just how much influence the entertainment industry has over individual creators like this. With all of the people giving unwaveringly positive reviews on audience-dividing films, even full-on demonizing people who dislike certain films, like The Last Jedi, I started to wonder just how deep this phenomenon of artificial media commentators went. When you go on television or read a newspaper or a magazine, you expect industry shills to give milquetoast opinions and hype up Disney films as masterpieces, because those those are mainstream outlets. But here on the internet, you used to get contrarian or nuanced opinions that contradicted the mainstream opinion. But somehow, that has changed. Somehow, the internet just became an extension of mainstream opinions with covert industry shills. I got thinking about this while watching Patrick H. Willems, movie reviewer and entertainment commentator. He's been on YouTube forever and has content going back 12 years. Patrick has a lot of really good content and unique perspectives on entertainment and regularly creates extremely insightful and informative videos. 90% of the time, his videos are great. People like him have created a high standard for YouTubers. I've watched dozens of videos from Patrick over the last decade and I never spent much time thinking about what goes on behind the scenes of his channel. I just assumed that he was a passionate filmmaker and movie lover with a desire to share his love for cinema. That is, until the Disney Star Wars controversy that happened between the making of Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi and J.J. Abrams' The Rise of Skywalker. Now I don't want to accuse Patrick of being a literal sellout or an industry plant, but there have been a couple of times where Patrick has come off as a full-on shill. Patrick's entire shtick is you're watching movies wrong. That's basically his tagline on IMDb. The reason I'm choosing Patrick as my target here is because he actively leans into the internet villain persona and invites this kind of reaction by telling his audience to shut up and that they are watching movies incorrectly. So I figure because he's intentionally inflammatory that he of all people on YouTube can handle being the target of this demonstration. Patrick's review and defense of The Last Jedi became quite infamous across the internet. If you are a person who thinks that SJWs, our diversity, our feminism ruined this movie, or if you're going to tell me that I'm a Disney shill, or if you think I should kill myself because I liked a movie, do people really care that much about Star Wars? Yeah, mom, they really do. But everyone should just remember, this is a film about space wizards intended for children. I'm not saying you shouldn't take it seriously, just maybe don't get too angry about it. We're not talking about gun control here. We're talking about a movie about space wizards intended for children. This screenshot of Patrick holding up a sign condescendingly telling people who hate the film that they're getting angry at a story about space wizards intended for children went viral. Now, I hated The Last Jedi as much as of the next guy. But I agree with Patrick's general sentiment here that it's not worth getting too angry about Star Wars. Star Wars was sacrificed on the holy altar in front of everyone and his beating heart was pulled out and we just watched it beat and slowly stop right on 
screen. And he's also right that wokeness, diversity, and feminism are not the problem with The Last Jedi. The problem is with the framing of his video. He created a perception that he believes getting angry at Star Wars was beneath him. And that made people angry with him. Because this was seen as a blanket insult towards critics of The Last Jedi. This was a subject to which everyone was already sensitive. There was a bizarre demonization of any critic of The Last Jedi that was rampant online at the time, and it appeared as if Patrick was joining in on that demonization of critics of The Last Jedi. Now you can love The Last Jedi, you can hate The Last Jedi, I don't care. This isn't about opinions of films. I don't care what your opinion is. This is about principles. This is about consistency and a demonstration of self-awareness. Because only a couple of years later, when the final film in the sequel trilogy was released, J.J. Abrams' The Rise of Skywalker, Patrick seemed to completely forget that this was the position that he had taken a couple of years earlier, and he posted this on Twitter. J.J. Abrams, how f dare you. Clearly demonstrating anger over a film about space wizards designed for children. Back then, I pointed this out in my Rise of Skywalker review because I was so confused how he could show such a blatant contradiction. Did he forget? Well, the funny thing was, Patrick wasn't the only reviewer that did this flip-flop between the two films. Patrick was not the only reviewer that demonized critics of the one, and then became a critic of the other. But how could Patrick fail to display any kind of principles? Why was he not displaying any kind of conviction? This is illogical. How does this happen? Was he just a Ryan Johnson fanboy willing to say whatever it took to defend The Last Jedi? Is Patrick just a big fat liar? The thing is, he is right about a lot of the points that he makes in his Last Jedi review, and I mostly agree with him that the film is not nearly as bad as people say that it is. And I agree that it's definitely not worth getting angry about. Star Wars was sacrificed on the holy altar. And he's right that diversity, feminism, and wokeness are not to blame for the destruction of Star Wars. The problem with The Last Jedi is meaningless sequences and diluted storylines, broken characters, and unresolved tensions. He did make one really good point that I liked. Watching rich people get their shit destroyed is one of the purest pleasures in all of cinema, and if you can't appreciate that, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, I get off on that. And I know I said this before, but the problem I have with this sequence is that Finn and Rose are saving dog horses when they should be saving slave children. But they just leave the slave children. Like, what the hell is that? I don't care who that kid with the broom is. It doesn't matter. What I do care about is the hope and determination I see in his eyes. I know I did that bit about hating The Last Jedi, but all these years later, I don't really hate the film. Rise of Skywalker is a genuinely worse movie. The Last Jedi has a lot of good to offer. For example, I love everything that happens on the island with Luke and Rey. Mark Hamill was wrong. I said to Ryan, I said, Jedis don't give up. I mean, even if he had a problem, he would uh, maybe take a year to try and regroup. But if he made a mistake, he would try and right that wrong. Luke would never say that. I'm sorry. Well, in this version, see, I'm talking about this, the George Lucas Star Wars. This is the next generation of Star Wars. So I almost had to think of Luke as another character. Uh, maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. The problem that I have with this video is not that Patrick is right or wrong about his points. The problem that I have here is that he admits that he's only making this video because people are angry about The Last Jedi. You 
Usually I'm here to talk about movies I think are underrated, that don't get the attention they deserve, but this one is different. I want to talk about the biggest movie of 2017, Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Because for some reason, a whole lot of people don't like this movie. A lot of people are really angry about it. He's admitting here that his entire motivation for making this video was to step in front of the wave of haters and tell them that they're wrong. And he entirely broke format on his his channel to do this. Why? Well, a couple of years ago, I found another video of Patrick's where he appears to display a complete lack of principles, titled, Shut Up! about plot holes. While watching this video, it started to dawn on me that Patrick may not have defended The Last Jedi in this overtly inflammatory way because he had a passionate disdain for people who get angry at Star Wars, but he may have made these statements because he was asked by a studio to make a video defending the film and demonizing people who get angry about it. He may have been asked to fulfill an agenda to deflect hatred for The Last Jedi. I realize that it's totally unfair of me to accuse him of being a shill like this when I have no direct proof. Again, I'm just using Patrick as a demonstration of what a shill looks like. In fact, he refutes that claim in his Last Jedi review. But wait until you see what I mean here. This plot holes video makes absolutely no goddamn sense. Okay, guys. We gotta talk about that. Plot holes used to be this thing that only existed in super nerdy movie conversations. Like, hey, how did Indiana Jones survive clinging to the outside of that submarine? But over the past 15 years, they've become pervasive, spreading through online movie conversations. Everywhere you turn, people are complaining about Again, Patrick does make a handful of really good points in this video, like the fact that a lot of the time when people complain about plot holes, they're really complaining about plot contrivances, or about characters making a decision that they themselves wouldn't make. No one seems to actually know what a plot hole is, and all those plot holes people complain about? they don't actually matter. What is a plot hole? People's definitions vary, but here's the generally accepted one that I use. A plot hole is a point in which a story breaks a previously established rule about its own universe. Basically, it's when a story contradicts itself. But overall, he completely misses the entire point people try to make about plot holes ruining their film watching experience. And often, he shows a misunderstanding of what plot holes even are, and fails to remain consistent with his argument. The point of this video is to highlight things that aren't really plot holes, but confusingly throughout this presentation, he regularly uses examples of legitimate plot holes, then dismisses them? So here's what are not plot holes. In The Dark Knight Rises, we never see how Batman gets back to Gotham City. That's a plot hole. See, that's an actual plot hole. But instead of exploring it, he condescendingly explains how films are presented to an audience? One of the earliest cinematic developments was the concept of montage. The idea is that when two images are presented in sequence, the audience understands that they occur chronologically and will mentally fill in the time between scenes. So for instance, if a person is in one location and the next scene they're in another location, we understand that in between scenes they traveled between the locations. Movies tend to assume that the audience is reasonably intelligent, but I guess they're wrong. If movies showed us every single second that happened during the span of the story, they would be 40 hours long and really Boring. See, the thing is, this is a real plot hole in Dark Knight Rises because the film goes out of its way to explain to the audience that it's impossible for people to get from the island to the mainland and back. All of the bridges have been destroyed and there are supposed to be guards set up everywhere to stop people from migrating across the river. When Batman gets exiled out of the city, the implication is that it shouldn't be possible for him to get back. And when Batman escaped the prison and started making his way back to Gotham, I think most of us were expecting a cool sequence explaining how he got across. So when the film just reveals that he's suddenly back in Gotham and doesn't even address the issue, it's extremely dissatisfying and it breaks immersion. Yes, he's Batman, he can do anything. But in a film about Batman, we shouldn't be taking for granted that Batman 
man can just break the rules of the universe without showing us how he's doing that. That's kind of the point of Batman. He does things other people can't do, but we usually get to see those things. It seemed like an obvious setup to show us a cool sequence about how he broke back into Gotham. Why set it up that way if that's not what you're gonna do? I hate this because Dark Knight Rises is legitimately the worst example of a plot hole in modern cinema. The problem is not that it happens off screen. The problem is the film told us it shouldn't be able to happen. This reminds me of J.J. Abrams' The Rise of Skywalker, where the film makes a point about the resistance being completely alone in the universe. Nobody else in the whole galaxy is willing to help them. They say it at the end of Last Jedi and at the beginning of Rise of Skywalker to remind us that nobody's going to help the resistance. Then Lando goes off screen and comes back with an entire fleet of ships from across the galaxy. No explanation how that happened. Totally broke the setup for this scene. And it's a double plot hole because the film also makes a point that you're not supposed to be able to get to this section of space without a specific wayfinder. It's impossible to navigate there without this Sith holocron. So the film also sets up that this fleet shouldn't have been able to make it there at all. Yet he just magically shows up with an entire fleet of ships. Sure, you might be able to make the argument that in The Dark Knight Rises when Batman breaks out of the prison and then he appears in in Gotham that that is montage. But Rise of Skywalker, that's not montage at all. They don't even allude that Lando is going to do this. At least in Dark Knight Rises, we knew that Batman was trying to make it back to Gotham. At another point in the video, Patrick uses Alien as an example of a plot hole that we should dismiss. In Alien, if the acid can melt through the floor, why doesn't it melt through the entire ship? But Patrick, this is explained in the film. I mean, this is explained in the very scene that we're literally watching right now. In this exact shot that you use, a character says, this is going to eat through the hull. And then the group chases the acid hole down several decks until it eventually dies off. And Ripley says, it looks like it's stopping. The film shows us how the acid works. This is an example of a film explaining to the audience the rules of the universe. This scene in Alien is an example of exactly how you avoid a plot hole in your film. You explain to the audience how something works, and then you stick with that rule. Near the end of the video, Patrick makes a point to mock nerds and nerd culture by intersplicing a clip of Angry Joe's initial reaction to The Last Jedi with a clip of The Simpsons. The plot holes. Remember the plot holes? So you're trying to tell me the Supremacy, Snoke's ship, isn't powerful enough to penetrate the shields. In episode 2 F09, when Ichi plays Scratchy's skeleton like a xylophone, he strikes the same rib twice in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. This is a perfect example of the kind of demonization of critics that I mean. It's so funny that Joe was talking about The Last Jedi. Ah, he's nothing if not consistent about that. Yes, he's right. Most internet nerds are not educated in filmmaking and are not the best film film critics. So nerds cannot really be expected to create the most meaningful in-depth film analyses for their YouTube audience. But you, Patrick, are. So you should very easily understand why they're reacting negatively to these story issues, even if they're failing to explain this properly. The problem is that plot holes destroy tension. A plot hole is a point in which a story breaks a previously established rule about its own universe. Basically, it's when a story contradicts itself. See, these are not good faith arguments made with the intention of changing people's minds. This plot hole video does not come off like Patrick came up with all of these arguments while he was thinking about this issue over time, and then one day he decided that he had to make a video about this because he felt passionately that he had to share these thoughts with the world. This video comes off like somebody asked 
asked him to make a video diminishing the internet's focus on plot holes, and then he had to scramble to come up with a handful of arguments in a week. This video hits hard. I get it. With the constantly changing locations, the heavy rock music, and the dynamic graphics and text, it gives this video the appearance of being a passion project. The high production value creates a perception of authority. But the multiple locations, though visually interesting and entertaining, also just seem to be haphazardly chosen. A lackluster way of making this video appear more dynamic than it really is. Why is he on a roof? Why is he in an alleyway? What does this mean for the subject of plot holes? Again, they appear to be randomly chosen backdrops that he quickly scrambled together, knowing that he could get access to these locations in his local area. If anything, all of these production elements just serve as a distraction from the fact that Patrick doesn't actually have a good argument in this video. If you want, you can find plot holes anywhere. They're all over your favorite movies. In Lord of the Rings, the Eagles could have just flown the ring to Mount Doom and saved everyone all that trouble. In Toy Story, why does Buzz freeze like the other toys when he thinks he's a real person? In Ocean's Eleven, how did they get the flyers into the vault? In Cinderella, why does the glass slipper stay when everything else disappears? In Gremlins, what does After Midnight technically mean? Isn't it always After Midnight? How does that rule make any sense? In Star Wars, why does the Death Star have a trash compactor when they can just jettison the trash into space? The worst argument that he makes in this video is, um... Take Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. At the climax of the story, Harry reaches the Triwizard Cup, which turns out to have been turned into a port key that transports him to Voldemort. So the villain's whole plan hinged on Harry being the one to get to the cup first and win the tournament. But really, any random object could have been turned into a port key, and they could have sent him to Voldemort way earlier without all that hassle. But that doesn't matter. We're so invested in Harry trying to figure out a way to win, and then so surprised by the reveal of the port key and Voldemort returning, that to pick apart the logic of the villain's plan would mean totally disengaging from the story. This, like so many plot holes, are things that would just destroy any conflict or drama and end the story immediately. I am in no way telling you to turn your brain off or to not think critically about movies. Not at all. I'm saying you should worry about the things that actually matter. That's not even an argument. What the f are you talking about? We hate plot holes because they ruin the experience. But according to Patrick, we shouldn't hate plot holes because that would ruin the experience? I... I just... What? That's not even a circular argument. That's like a Mobius strip argument. How do you not get this? This entire video just exists to diminish the perception that modern films are poorly written compared to older films and deflect from frustration about that on the internet. Nerds caught on that films are not as good as they used to be and Patrick is like just trying to hide that or something. The thing is, Patrick is correct when he explains explains that this entire phenomenon of pointing out plot holes in films is a relatively recent development in our culture, and it only exists as a result of the internet. Why is it that in the 80s or 90s or early 2000s, no one really cared about plot holes? They still existed, but no one ever complained a movie was bad because of all the plot holes. So what happened? Basically, the internet. Cracked published the article, Eight Classic Movies That Got Away With Gaping Plot Holes. There were more forum posts. Then in 2009, the TV Tropes page for Plot Hole was created. In 2010, it really began. Articles on Wired, The Escapists, Den of Geek, and Kotaku. Plot holes had officially crossed over into mainstream nerd culture. Pop culture commentary from a nerdy fan perspective began exploding in popularity. And immediately, the types of videos that proved most popular were humorous analyses of popular movies focusing on surface-level nitpicks. And over the next several years, these types of videos grew in number and popularity. Most of those old sites that talked about plot holes were just novelty sites. The internet used to be really different, and most outlets just posted BuzzFeed quality stuff for entertainment. These plot hole sites were never really meant to be taken seriously. It was just fun to go through old iconic films and break them down for their contrived stories. Then one day, the internet eventually started taking taking those things seriously. He is right about that. No one is really to blame for this. Okay, CinemaSins definitely deserves some of the blame, but it's not just them. This is way bigger. This is about cultural shifts coinciding with evolving technology. The problem here is that even if Patrick is right that this is something that only nerds care about, and it only exists because the internet opened people up to this form of criticism, that doesn't make these criticisms any less valid. That doesn't delegitimize 
minimize the points that nerds make. This is just a bad argument. And he's really just dismissing it because he sees himself as above nerds. All he's really saying here is only nerds care about this, therefore they are wrong. Like, like his only point here is that you should not be a nerd. This is not a logical argument. This is just posturing. Just because you can lay out the timeline of something doesn't mean that you're above it. Siskel and Ebert may have never talked about plot holes in their entire career, but just because they never spent much time thinking about them, that doesn't make plot holes any less frustrating. And that doesn't mean that plot holes never affected their opinions of films. In fact, they would often talk about how frustrating or confusing a story was. So even though most people are using the term plot hole incorrectly, all of these complaints are rooted in the same thing. But movies aren't about logic. They're not equations. They're not proofs. They're not puzzles. Movies are not math. Die Hard is a movie about an ordinary man thrown into an impossible situation who needs to rise to the occasion and persevere so that he can reunite with his estranged wife. That's the point of the movie. That's what it's about. He's right here. Films are not about the individual story elements. Films are supposed to be about the characters. But as another YouTuber pointed out, films are also not about the lighting. They're not about the cinematography. Films are not about the sound. But a poorly lit poorly shot, terrible sounding film is still going to be received poorly by the audience. When creating a film, you have to take into account how an audience is going to receive and experience that film. There are expectations. When we watch a film, we want to be immersed into the story and into the world by putting ourselves in the shoes of a character. And it's hard to do that when the story tells us that we can't do something, giving us specific expectations about what should be allowed, and then someone just goes ahead and does that thing anyways without any kind of explanation. That's not immersive. Specific story elements create tension, and then breaking those rules breaks the tension. And yes, most plot holes are not as big a deal as most nerds say they are. I also agree with that. But there are varying degrees of plot holes. Each individual audience member will react differently to them depending on their own personal immersion to the story, and eventually everyone will have a breaking point where a story becomes so contrived that it just knocks them out of it. I know it seems impossible to watch movies wrong, but you're watching movies wrong. Yeah, this is what I mean. You can't just tell somebody that they're wrong for not liking something. What does it mean to tell the audience that they're wrong for hating a film? Why does it matter to him at all? Who does this hurt? Hurt. The reason I keep harping on this is because it doesn't serve the consumer. It serves the studios. Patrick doesn't care about how audiences feel about modern films. He only cares about how this is reflected on the filmmakers. Ultimately, by demonizing audiences for having a negative reaction to a film, this video just hurts the consumer. Both of Patrick's videos that I highlighted here hurt the consumer. Trying to lump all of the haters together into one weird package, there's a clear effort from Hollywood to shout down hatred of films and create a negative perception of critics. And the only benefit of that is to protect the studios by creating a perception that they are infallible. Movies tend to assume that the audience is reasonably intelligent but I guess they're wrong. Our only real power as consumers is to write on forums and to make YouTube videos asking for certain things in films and then complaining online when we don't get what we expect from those films. If we were to take Patrick's advice and shut up about this, we would lose that one little bit of power that we have in our relationship with these products. Hollywood would be very happy if we were to lose our voice. So look, watch whatever YouTube videos you want, think whatever you want about movies, just please. So what was Patrick's motivation for making this video? What about the modern fixation on plot holes made him feel passionate enough to refute the internet's frustration? I mean, 
Patrick is basically telling his audience that they are wrong for not enjoying films that have broken stories. The issue that I have with both of these videos is not his points, and it's not his opinion, and it's not even his conclusion. The problem that I have with both of these videos is the premise. His desire to get in front of the hate by telling those people that they're wrong for feeling hatred. But in the process, he showed a fundamental misunderstanding of why people feel frustrated with modern films. He doesn't even seem to want to try to relate with the problem or understand people's frustrations. He just wanted to present a negative opinion about an online trend, and it appears as if he's doing it to to unwaveringly support the film industry like a shill.